Thanks, John. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here and to uh, hang out with uh, uh, folks from the ENCODE meeting, and for me to, uh, to learn uh, more about uh, ENCODE and how to use the, the vast resources, although I, I would say that I've been a, uh, on the sidelines watching ENCODE for many, uh, many years and uh, have, have benefited uh, greatly from some of the data sets. So what I'd like to do this morning is, is uh, as John said, to tell you about uh, our work on the selection and function of signal-dependent enhancers. Uh, th this is a topic that you've already uh, heard about, uh, to some extent, from Evan Rosen and others yesterday. And to focus on our work uh, in which uh, we study the macrophage. And so just as uh, an introduction, we all know that different cell types arise from differential transcription of the same genome. And over the past decade, uh, the advent of, of uh, massively parallel sequencing-based technologies has, has really given us unprecedented uh, uh, tools to examine the mechanisms that underlie, uh, underlie uh, the development of each cell type from its progenitor cell. Uh, in addition, <coughs> uh, once a cell attains its specific uh, identity, that, that cell has to be able to respond to internal and external signals in order to carry out its physiologic roles. And what I'm illustrating here um, is the ability of, of two different cell types to respond to the same signal in a very dramatic uh, fashion. And, and here I'm illustrating macrophages and B cells. So macrophages are an immune cell that's in, involved in innate immunity. Uh, among other things, they have the ability to recognize and kill bacteria. B cells are a cell in the adaptive immune si uh, system. They're specialized for making antibodies. Both of these cell types will respond to bacterial lipos lipopolysaccharide. That's a component of gram-negative bacteria. That activates toll-like receptor 4. And in each cell type, it induces a very strong <coughs> transcriptional response. But you'll see from this illustration uh, that despite the fact that both cells will uh, induce hundreds of genes, this program of induction is, is largely different, uh, with macrophages and B cells uh, exhibiting uh, quite distinct transcriptional programs. And if you look at the uh, functional annotations that are associated with the induced genes, you'll see that they're quite different. So then in macrophages, the, the functional annotations are associated with uh, immune response and chemotaxis. And in the B cell, these responses are uh, associated with the uh, processes that are required to make uh, and secrete antibodies. And then uh, the third point, uh, which I'll um, sort of pick up on some of the things that Nancy Cox uh, spoke about yesterday, is that signal-dependent responses of the same cell type can vary among individuals. And here what I'm showing you is data, uh, gene expression data, uh, taken from uh, endothelial cells uh, that were provided by about 150 uh, hearts for uh, heart transplantation. So these are aortic endothelial cells. These are critical cells um, uh, for uh, blood vessel homeostasis, and they're important cells in the, in the development of atherosclerosis. And what is uh, shown here is a uh, chart in, in which the ex uh, basal expression levels for FGD6 are, um, are organized according to basal expression in about 120 samples. And then in addition to this basal expression, these cells have been treated with a substance called OxPAPC. It's an oxidized phospholipid. It's thought that this is a very important molecule in driving uh, the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. And you can see uh, that uh, each individual uh, has a variable uh, response to the exposure of this treatment. This is uh, shown as in the open circles where uh, some individuals respond quite dramatically and other uh, individuals respond uh, either not at all <clears throat> or actually negatively. And this response is actually linked to uh, uh, genetic variation and, in fact, dependent on the, um, uh, the genotype. Uh, this represents a, a gene by environment um, uh, quantitative uh, EQTL. Now, these uh, <clears throat> Uh, variants are in linkage just equal, equilibrium with 20 to 30 other variants. So we don't know from these experiments what the actual variant is that accounts for this, uh, these, these changes in um, 
uh, gene expression, and of course this is one of the things that we would like to use genomic methods to understand. And collectively, these uh, observations are consistent with the observation that most GWAS uh, hits are, uh, that uh, are associated with SNPs uh, reside in non-coding regions of the genome. And so this implies that at least some of the natural genetic variation that we observe that's associated uh, with these differences in traits has to do with uh, the impact on uh, transcription. Now the uh, cis-regulatory elements that regulate uh, transcription um, include promoters, which are the obligatory start sites for messenger RNAs, and enhancers. Uh, we have known for uh, quite some time that while promoters are essential for the initiation of messenger RNAs, they are not sufficient to confer the levels of expression or the tissue different uh, responses that are required for physiologic levels of, uh, of gene expression. And in order to attain uh, appropriate uh, developmental and homeostatic programs of gene expression, uh, the uh, additional functions of enhancers are required, and these operate uh, in a tissue-specific and signal-dependent manner. And so just to uh, re uh, review a few of the key features of enhancers, uh, this uh, cartoon here is, is meant to illustrate a, uh, a functional unit of enhancer. Enhancer, these would be uh, nucleosomes. They are uh, remodeled to generate a nucleosome-free region. Uh, these uh, sequences act at a distance from promoters to enhance gene expression. Their function is determined by the sequence-specific transcription factors that are bound. Uh, they exhibit a distinct epigenetic signature. We've heard a lot about this. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm, I'm just going to focus on uh, the modifications of histone H3 lysine 4. Uh, monomethylation, uh, as discovered by Bing Ren, is, a, is a, in excess of trimethylation, is, is a signature of enhancers, uh, and enhancers that are active uh, tend to be acetylated, and one of the acetylation marks associated with active enhancers is H3K27. Now, uh, the work of the ENCODE consortium <coughs> has uh, really dramatically advanced our understanding of how uh, these uh, enhancers uh, are selected, and uh, through the annotation of, of hundreds of, of cells uh, using a variety of, of uh, uh, combinations of histone uh, marks, uh, it is suggested that there may be on the order of a million uh, of these types of functional elements uh, within the genome. So, so for me, this was really uh, a staggering uh, revelation, uh, probably to me one of the most important contributions of the ENCODE consortium uh, was, was to tell us that uh, there is this vast repertoire of uh, potential uh, regulatory uh, information in the genome, and clearly the, the number of regulatory elements greatly exceed uh, the number of genes, and this is uh, likely essential for the um, driving the complex programs of gene expression that we see in different cell types. Now. Uh, what does this look like? Uh, this is a uh, genome browser shot uh, that I cobbled together from um, data from the ENCODE consortium. What I've done here is, is to actually combine tracks for H3K4 trimethylation, uh, which, which is uh, present at promoters, with H3K4 monomethylation at enhancers, and to do so for three different cell types. So what you're looking at from top to bottom are these composite tracks for macrophages, T cells, and smooth muscle cells. And this browser track uh, happens to uh, be located in the vicinity of the, uh, the C-FOS gene. So FOS is a, a member of the AP1 family of transcription factors. It's very widely expressed, and it plays uh, different roles in different cell types, and its responses to internal and external signals differ in a cell type dependent manner. And while the promoter of FOSS is marked by histone modifications in all cell types it's, uh, at, at the promoter, what you'll observe looking upstream and downstream of the transcriptional start site is that the uh, genomic landscape is, is very cell type specific. So for example, here in smooth muscle cells, we see histone modifications associated uh, with enhancers that are smooth muscle cell specific, whereas here we see a modification that's specific to T cells and here a modification that is observed both in T cells and macrophages. So uh, we can imagine that in smooth muscle cells, this region of the genome may be important 
in driving the expression of, of FOSS uh, in smooth muscle cell specific contexts. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is transition to our um, laboratory's work on, on macrophages and what we've learned about how macrophages <coughs> select their enhancers. Uh, I've already briefly introduced this cell. This is, a, uh, this is an ancient cell. It, uh, it precedes, it, it's present in organisms that, that lack an adaptive immune system. So this is a, an innate immune cell that you can find, for example, in, in Drosophila. Uh, among their functions, they play essential roles in the response to infection and injury. They can recognize pathogens through pattern recognition receptors and initiate uh, a process that we refer to as innate immunity. And that, in turn, uh, plays important roles in, in instructing the adaptive immune system uh, <clears throat> to combat infection. Now, interestingly, uh, and this is something that the macrophage world is still learning a lot about, these, these cells reside in all of the tissues of your body. And within each tissue, they play these roles as innate immune cells. But in, in, um, in addition to that, they contribute to the uh, homeostasis of that particular tissue. So for example, in, in your brain, you have a type of macrophage called a microglia cell. That cell within the brain is playing important roles in secreting trophic factors that are important for neurons. The cell uh, prunes synapses. Uh, this is important during development. Uh, and it, it is uh, responsible for <coughs> eating protein aggregates such as amyloid beta. And these types of tissue-specific homeostatic functions are, are uh, found for virtually all of the macrophage populations that have been studied. Now, uh, finally, uh, one of our motivations uh, for studying these cells is that we, we also know that macrophages play uh, key roles in numerous diseases. Uh, so for example, uh, macro, if you take a macrophage out of the mouse, uh, the mouse no longer uh, has the ability to develop atherosclerosis. And we know that in, in humans, macrophages contribute to virtually all phases of the development of this disease. Uh, macrophages are also involved in the uh, generation of insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. Uh, I've alluded to roles of, of microglia in the, in the brain as being homeostatic, but there now is, is, is uh, substantial evidence that uh, inappropriate activation of macrophages contributes to a broad spectrum of, of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease. And finally, virtually all tumors uh, contain macrophages. The content of tumor uh, macrophages is often a predictor of uh, disease outcome. And uh, within tumors, macrophages contribute to um, tumor biology and, and tumor metastasis. And so we're very interested in understanding uh, how macrophages select their enhancers because our thinking is that the, uh, the selection of the enhancer repertoire is what gives the macrophage its phenotype and that uh, enables it to carry out its homeostatic roles. Uh, in health and its pathogenic roles in disease. Now, our uh, real uh, entry point into this uh, <clears throat> began uh, several years ago with the work of Sven Heinz and Chris Benner. Uh, Sven was very interested in a uh, transcription factor called PU.1, uh, which is required for the development of macrophages, B cells, and granulocytes. And we knew that from uh, gene deletion experiments. And from these types of experiments and other uh, uh, sorts of, uh, of studies, uh, we also knew at the time that in addition to PU.1, the development of macrophages required CBPs and AP1 transcription factors, and the development of B cells required E2A, EBF, and OCT transcription factors. Sven was very interested in the question of how a, a single transcription factor like PU.1 uh, could be involved in two different differentiation programs. In, in essence, the same transcription factor was looking at the same DNA template and yet having different functions in these two cell types. And so uh, what he did was to perform a chip sequencing experiment for P1, and he identified uh, not only c common sites of P1 binding in these two cell types, but he also identified binding sites of P1 that were either macrophage-specific or B cell-specific. And one of the immediate uh, outcomes of these experiments that um, resulted from the motif analysis that uh, Chris Benner uh, made available was that uh, even at uh, binding sites for P.1 that were very macrophage specific on the one hand or B cell specific on the other hand, the motif, the binding motif uh, 
that was observed for Pew.1 was exactly the same. So the, the cell-specific binding of Pew.1 had nothing to do with the sequence that Pew.1 uh, recognized. <clears throat> However, in the vicinity of the macrophage-specific P1 binding sites, uh, Chris found that motifs for AP1 and CBP transcription factors were highly enriched. And of course, this was very exciting to us because we knew from prior genetic studies that AP1 and CBP factors were required for macrophage differentiation. And conversely, on the B cell side, uh, what was found in the vicinity of P1 binding sites were the motifs for other lineage determining factors uh, for B cells. Now this uh, was not just at a subset of, of uh, <coughs> enhancers within the macrophage. By combining chip sequencing for H3K4 monomethyl, the enhancer mark, and chip seq data for P1 and CVP, uh, we made what I thought at the time was a very uh, surprising observation. And that's illustrated here on the right. So the, the pi represents the total world of enhancers within the macrophage. And what we observed was that uh, Pew 1 and CBP, either alone or together, were residing at about two-thirds of the enhancers. So this, this was really quite remarkable, and not only in the vicinity of, of genes that we think of as being highly specific to macrophages, uh, these enhancers were, were in the vicinity of many of the genes. The, the vast majority of genes are actually expressed in macrophages. And one uh, interesting uh, point that fell out of this analysis uh, was when, that when Chris Benner uh, simply analyzed the motifs that were enriched in macrophages uh, for H3K4 monomethyl, so, so looking at the macrophage enhancers, three motifs came out that, to a much higher degree of enrichment than anything else. And these are the motifs for P1, AP1, and CBP. And this, this suggested to us that one could actually discover the motifs for the main lineage determining factors for a cell simply by looking at what was in, enriched in the enhancer <coughs> uh, landscape of that cell type. And Chris went on uh, to actually use ENCODE data uh, to, to, uh, to look at what was in the uh, enhancer-like uh, elements of, of many cell types. Uh, here I'm illustrating B cells, ES cells, and liver. And in each case, uh, the motif analysis of the enhancer-like regions returned uh, either known uh, lineage determining factors or what we would then speculate would be putative lineage determining factors for these cell types. We were particularly excited uh, when we saw this uh, outcome for embryonic stem cells because uh, this motif analysis revealed three of the four factors that Yamanaka had found were necessary to convert uh, fibroblasts into iPS cells. The fourth factor uh, here is ESRR beta. This was not in uh, Yamanaka's original mix, but the top four factors on this list actually are sufficient to convert iPS cells uh, to, to uh, convert uh, fibroblasts to iPS cells. And we've gone on to do this type of analysis for a number of cell types and uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, David uh, Brenner's group, we've identified lineage determining factors for hepatic stellate cells, and uh, we've also done this for, uh, glomer 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 for kidney cells. <laughs> uh, sorry, I couldn't get that one out. Uh, so uh, Chris and Spann, working with Nathan Spann, uh, performed a number of gain and loss of function experiments uh, looking at the mechanisms that enabled Pew1 and CBP uh, to, to uh, bind to enhancer-like regions in the macrophage. And what they uh, found is, is uh, summarized here, and that is when regions of the genome contained binding sites uh, for P1 and CBP that were within about 100 base pairs of each other, uh, these were the genomic locations that were likely to be bound by P1 in the macrophage, whereas when uh, P1 binding sites were nearby, binding sites for B cell lineage determining factors, such as OCT, then these regions of the genome would be occupied by, P, uh, by uh, P1, in this case, in a B cell specific manner. And what we found was that these interactions, uh, and, and what we really studied were the places in the genome where P1 and CBP were together, uh, these, these places uh, in the genome required what we called collaborative binding. So if we took away P1, for example, in the macrophage, 
then at these locations, CBP wouldn't bind. And if we took away CBP, P1 wouldn't bind. So we think of these as pioneering factors, but they can't find their genomic sites by themselves. So we, we think of this as kind of a Lewis and Clark tag team uh, pioneering mechanism where they both have to be together and uh, th this uh, presence, probably at high concentrations, allows them to compete with nucleosomes to establish a nucleosome-free region. Now these types of, of uh, elements uh, can be observed at tens of thousands of locations in uh, the macrophage genome. And we know that some of these are active, but others are, are not. And so we became very interested in, in how a, uh, an open region of chromatin could be transitioned from inactive to active. And we used the uh, toll-like receptor 4 signaling pathway that I already told you about as an important um, type of signal to, uh, to understand this better. So TLR4 signaling leads to the activation of a number of latent transcription factors, and, uh, and a very important uh, uh, target is NF-kappa B. And what we realized by performing uh, chip sequencing for NF-kappa B before and after stimulation is that upon stimulation and entry into the nucleus, uh, the, the, the binding events uh, for NF-kappa B were very cell type specific. And in fact, they uh, mostly, and when I say mostly, I'm, I'm saying about between 80 and 90 percent of the binding of NF-kappa B occurred at regions in the genome that were previously established by P1 and or CBP. And so what, uh, uh, that was the case in the macrophage and in the B cell by P1 and a lineage determining factor uh, for B cells, such as OCT. <coughs> And so what this meant is, was that the uh, lineage determining factors that set up open regions of, of, of chromatin were, were basically instructing the signal dependent factor where to go upon activation. And this, of course, then determined the downstream target genes that would become activated. So we think that this is a, uh, a major uh, explanation for what I showed you at the beginning, which is why macrophages and, and B cells responding to the same signal have such a dramatic uh, difference in their transcriptional output. And to give you just an example of this, this is uh, a browser uh, image in the vicinity of the prostaglandin E synthase gene. This is a gene that is uh, expressed at very low levels in a resting macrophage, but is induced uh, by orders of magnitude. Uh, in response to the uh, uh, stimulation of the TLR4 signaling pathway. Here we're using a uh, very pure form of LPS called KLA. And what you observe in this uh, uh, illustration here is that in the absence of treatment, uh, you can observe binding of uh, P1 and CBP upstream of the prostaglandin E synthase gene. This is associated with histone uh, H3 lysine 4 dimethylation. Uh, but under these conditions, the gene is off. Now, when the cells are activated and NF-kappa B enters the nucleus, you can see that it is uh, binding very, at very precise locations that line up with the pre-existing binding sites for P1 and CBP. So we uh, hypothesize that the binding of NF-kappa B to these regions of the genome that are pre-existing now arms this uh, set of enhancers and allows them to communicate to the prostaglandin E synthase promoter and massively upregulate gene expression. So from these types of studies, uh, we developed uh, what we call a, a, a collaborative hierarchical model for enhancer selection and activation in, in macrophages and B cells. Uh, the, the, the uh, collaborative part of the model is on the left, and this is where cell fate determining factors, which are expressed in cell restricted combinations, collaborate with each other and additional factors to bind DNA and initiate uh, a nucleosome remodeling. And these are factors that establish cellular identity, and they, they have uh, reprogramming potential. And uh, <clears throat> since uh, that number of, of factors, at least in the macrophages, is really quite small. It, it helps us, I think, understand how one can actually reprogram a cell from one type to another with, uh, with a relatively simple set of, uh, of, of transcription factors. 
Now these uh, cell fate determining factors we think set the stage for uh, what we refer, as, refer to as cell state determining factors. So these would be factors like NF kappa B. Uh, these factors are broadly expressed. Uh, they, uh, as I've shown you for NF kappa B, primarily localized to pre-existing or primed enhancers. And we observe that type of pattern with many different signal dependent transcription factors such as uh, nuclear hormone receptors. And these are the factors that confer responsiveness to internal and external signals. Now, at this stage, uh, we wanted to um, test the model genetically. And uh, one thought that Casey Romanowski in the laboratory had was that we could do that by uh, actually exploiting natural genetic variation. And, and the idea was to use the millions of SNPs that are provided by differences between inbred strains of mice as a genome-wide mutagenesis strategy. And uh, so we, we did that by performing chip sequencing for P1 and other factors in macrophages that were derived from two strains of mice, uh, C57 black 6 and BALB-C. Uh, BALB-C has about 4 million SNPs compared to um, <coughs> Uh, black 6, and the idea was to test what the impact would be of mutations that occurred within the binding site for P1 or CBP or NF kappa B in one of these signal dependent uh, enhancers. And what we found was that mutations in P1 motifs not only abolished the binding of P1, but when that occurred, it, it uh, coordinately abolished the binding of CBP. And conversely, mutations in CBP motifs reduce the nearby binding of P1. So this was very consistent with our collaborative model. In order for one to be there, the other had to be there. Mutations in kappa B motifs rarely reduce the binding of, of uh, P1 or CBP, whereas mutations in P1 or CBP frequently reduce the binding of NF kappa B. So that was the hierarchical uh, part of the model. And if we looked at all of the places uh, in these two strains of macrophages where NF kappa B, and here we followed NF kappa B with a chip for P65, if we looked at all the places where it differed in one strain versus the other, only 9% of those differences could be explained by mutations in the NF kappa B binding site itself. And we actually observed many more uh, frequent events that caused a loss of NF kappa B binding in one strain or, or the other as being due to mutations in uh, one of the three lineage determining factors. And collectively, if we add all this up, we can explain about 35% of the NF kappa B binding by mutations in the lineage determining factors. Now, this plus this is about 43% or 44%, so we still have a lot to learn about what determines strain-specific NF kappa B binding, but this, I think, takes us a, a, a great distance from where we were uh, previously. And so this uh, 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 supported this collaborative uh, and hierarchical mo model, <coughs> um, but uh, I would also say that this model is vastly oversimplified and it has poor predictive value. What we ultimately like to get to is to be able to look at the genomic sequence and, and with the combination of the sequence in front of us and a knowledge of the transcription factors that are expressed in the cell to actually be able to predict what the enhanced landscape is going to look like, and uh, we are far from being able to do that. This model also fails to explain how new enhancers are selected. So what I've told you about is really only relevant for a cell that has achieved its identity, you know, presumably is living in a tissue and is looking around and, and responding to, 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 to signals. And this really does not account for how a cell gets from cell type A to cell type B uh, during development. <coughs> Uh, it also fails to account for the functions of the majority of transcription factors that are expressed in macrophages, and its relevance to in vivo populations is unclear. And so very recently, um, we've begun to try and look at how enhancers are selected and function within tissues. And our first uh, shot at this was a comparison of tissue resident macrophage subsets. One of the subsets we looked at were the macrophages that live in the brain. Uh, and we also looked at two separate populations of macrophages that live within the peritoneal cavity. These are the large and small peritoneal macrophages, and these have important roles in controlling the immune system uh, in the gut. And uh, we started simply by looking at the transcriptomes of these macrophage uh, populations, and quite remarkably, 
maybe not so remarkably, I don't know, I was surprised by this, uh, the, the, the transcriptomes of the macrophage that live in the peritoneal cavity and the macrophages that live in the brain are quite different. So there are nearly a thousand genes in each direction that are more than 16-fold differentially expressed in these two populations of macrophages, whereas uh, the, the macrophages that live together, the small and the large peritoneal macrophages that are in the uh, peritoneal cavity, uh, their gene expression patterns are much more similar. The small peritoneal cavities uh, overexpress about 200 genes. And these differences in gene expression are actually mirrored by their enhancer landscapes. So uh, what you're looking at here are uh, scatter plots for H3K4 dimethyl, which is marking both enhancers and promoters. The promoters are color-coded in blue. Uh, and what you can see is that the, the uh, perineal macrophages in the microglia uh, have a much uh, greater distribution of enhancer uh, strength. These would be perineal macrophage-specific enhancers or enhancer-like elements. These would be microglia enhancer-like elements. And about 15 to 20 percent of the enhancers are specific to each cell type. Uh, whereas in the peritoneal cavity, uh, the small peritoneal cavity, small peritoneal macrophages have a set of enhancers corresponding to those differentially expressed uh, genes that I just showed you. So one of our uh, big questions is how do you get these uh, different enhancers? And to uh, go back to our uh, playbook, uh, for macrophage and B-cell specific enhancers, we use pew.1 as a way of, of telling us uh, where the cell specific enhancers were and what the collaborating transcription factors are. And we know from doing a chip sequencing experiment that pew1 is residing at many of the microglia specific enhancers and many of the uh, large peritoneal macrophage specific enhancers. So we're going to basically take the same approach and we're going to ask what are the uh, factors that pew1 has to collaborate with in order to set up a microglia-specific enhancer or a resident peritoneal-specific enhancer. And now we're going to build on this concept that I told you about of using natural genetic variation. In the first instance of what I told you about, we used natural genetic variation basically as a way of testing the model. But now what we're going to do is we're going to actually try and use it as a way of discovering what the collaborative factors are. And we're going to extend the amount of genetic variation that we use from uh, a single mouse uh, to many mice, and we're going to take advantage of a lot more genetic variation here using up to 40 million SNPs that are provided by SPRET. And the basic idea uh, of what we're going to try and do is, is shown here. Uh, as I've told you, P1 cannot effectively find its genomic binding sites by itself. It, it has to uh, collaborate with other factors. And so we will assume that every place in the genome that P1 binds uh, is a place where there are uh, other factors, let's call them transcription factor X. And at most genomic locations, this collaborative interaction and this DNA target sequence will be the same. Uh, so we'll see equivalent binding of P1 in, in strain one and strain two. But at places where variation uh, affects the template and affects the binding of P1, then we will see strain-specific binding of, of P1. Now, most of the genetic variation that results in very dramatic differences in, in the binding is due to mutations in the binding site for P1 itself. Uh, so that's not surprising, but it's also not informative. What we're looking for are places in the genome where there is strain-specific binding of P.1, but there is no mutation in the P.1 binding site. So at those locations, what we are hypothesizing is that a variant has interrupted or mutated the motif for a collaborative factor. And so now the, the exercise, and this was uh, developed by Casey Romanowski, the, the exercise is to really try and uh, find evidence for this. And the, the approach that she took was to look at the expression of all of the transcription factors that are expressed in the macrophage. She selected the top 100 uh, most expressed factors. She identified their uh, motif. And then she basically looked for the presence of that motif in the vicinity of, of P1 and asked whether or not that uh, motif had a variant comparing one strain to the next. And so an example of this is shown here. What has uh, been done is to rank order uh, 
the uh, pew one binding sites with respect to their uh, differential expression, in this case, between SPRET and BLAC6, from <clears throat> the most BLAC6 binding on the left to the most uh, SPRET-specific binding on the right, the actual uh, relative binding uh, profile is shown here. And then she's color coding uh, P1 binding sites as to whether or not there is an ISRE nearby that has a mutation. And what you'll appreciate from this picture is that uh, red is concentrated to the right and blue is concentrated to the left. And so what this means is that um, variants that are in the ISRE uh, <clears throat> tend to be associated with binding strength of, uh, of nearby P1, and this uh, relationship is highly statistically significant. And so from this type of analysis, we would conclude that factors that bind to the ISRE are important collaborative factors for P1 in the macrophage. And so if, if one then goes through that exercise for all of the 100 top expressed transcription factors, then we ultimately identify uh, dozens of motifs where mutations affect the, binding, the nearby binding of P1. The most significant of these are, are mutations in the ETH sites. So these are the sites that I told you are not very interesting. These are just sites that are probably directly affecting the binding of P1. But everything from here on over represents a mutation in a motif for, for a factor that's not P1. And we identify, as I said, dozens of motifs that bind factors. The names of the factors are shown below. And um, uh, we observe motifs that are uh, present in uh, both microglia and large peritoneal macrophages uh, that seem to be generally important. We observe motifs that are specific for the large peritoneal macrophages, and we observe motifs that are specific uh, for microglia. And importantly, uh, we observe motifs uh, in, in more than one strain. So this, this is like a, a confirmation GWAS study. So if we find a motif that's important in the spread mouse and then find the same motif again, but for different mutations in NOD, then we're pretty confident that we found a motif that is important. And, and for most of the motifs that we identified, we've confirmed uh, mutations in both strains. Now, um, we're, of course, interested in how these uh, transcription factors actually work and, and to what extent do, do they relate to the different environments that the macrophages live in. Uh, David Gosselin did a very interesting experiment in which he took the cells out of the animal and he put them in a tissue culture dish. And we know that gene expression changes when you put uh, cells, when you take cells out of the body and put them into culture. But one of the, the interesting uh, points that came out of this analysis was the ability to compare the, the macrophages from the peritoneum and the microglia from the brain. Uh, we saw hundreds of genes that were differentially regulated in culture for the most part, we saw loss of gene expression. And the, the uh, interesting point was that the genes that were lost in the peritoneal macrophages were the genes that made them most different from microglia and vice versa. The, the genes that made microglia most microglia-like were the genes that were lost compared to the peritoneal macrophages in, in culture. So they, basically the cells lost their distinctive personalities when they were taken out of the environment. And, and what this is telling us is that the environment is constantly instructing these cells as to what their identities are. And interestingly, I'm not going to show you the data, this change in gene expression was associated with the collapse of a very large uh, fraction of the enhancer landscape. So uh, virtually all of the enhancers that were uh, specific, for example, to microglia were, were greatly reduced with respect to their uh, epigenetic features. And in consistent with this, uh, if we now look at the factors that bind motifs that were identified as being important for P1 binding, we find that about half of the uh, transcription factors that bind these motifs in peritoneal macrophages were environment dependent. And so this now begins to give us a lot of insight into how the environment instructs the cell to set up enhancers that are important for that cell type. And that's uh, illustrated in this uh, cartoon here. And basically, uh, our idea is that there's a core set of, of enhancers that are primed that, are, uh, that we think are common to all of the tissue macrophage populations. And these enhancers have the ability to respond to, to various signals. Uh, 
but those signals are uh, dependent on the anatomic content, context. So for example, an, an, environment, an environmental signal that's only present in the peritoneal cavity will act on the set of enhancers selectively in the peritoneal macrophage. This uh, set of enhancers will then turn on direct target genes and included in this set of direct target genes are transcription factors that can collaborate with Q1 to set up new and to set up a new set of enhancers and it's this combined output of direct targets and indirect targets that help build new enhancers that establish the um, uh, the peritoneal macrophage phenotype and so we think that this is a process that's going on in all of the tissue resident macrophage populations now what we've been studying here are um, transcription factor combinations that bind to specific regulatory elements in mouse macrophages we're obviously very interested in in how all of this plays out in humans. Uh, a very important paper for us uh, came out of Stam's lab uh, last year that, that uh, I think is, is to us uh, very important in, in going further and extending, uh, at least conceptually, some of the observations that we're making. And that is that uh, if you look at individual DNA bases where transcription factors bind, there's, there's actually very little conservation uh, between mouse and human. Uh, as you build that up to footprints, you gain a little bit of conservation. Uh, transcription factor to transcription factor connections, you get a little bit better. Strikingly, regulatory networks are very highly conserved. And we think that what we're looking at is really a component of a, uh, these, these transcription factor collaborative interactions fall within this general realm of regulatory network architecture. So we think that what we learn in the mouse, uh, we will probably be able to confirm in humans, although I would make the point that there's enough genetic variation among human individuals to do a, a, a lot of what I showed you that we did in the strains in mice. So for some take home points, um, uh, first I would say that knowledge of the enhancer landscape of a cell reveals much about that cell's identity and its regulatory potential. Uh, enhancer landscapes enable prediction of key lineage determining transcription factors and sites of action of signal dependent factors. Uh, transcription factor binding maps uh, will uh, inform analysis of genetic variation. And uh, this last point uh, I, for us is very important. We think that we can use natural genetic variation to discover regulatory networks that drive cell specific gene expression. Now going forward we're very interested in um, trying to take what we've learned uh, to understand and, and uh, hopefully modify roles of macrophages in human disease. And so going forward, uh, this is taking us into increasingly challenging uh, areas where we can't isolate a million cells. We can isolate maybe 5,000 cells uh, or 1,000 cells. And, and in that cell population, we want to know what's going on. So we're definitely going to need to improve the methodology to define regulatory networks and specific cell types uh, within complex tissues. Uh, very little of that has been done uh, as of yet. And what we'd like to be able to do is to use these methods to determine the effects of cell autonomous and non-autonomous disease mechanisms on enhancer selection and function. So to give you the example of the brain, uh, you know, we think that a primary pathological process such as a, 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 an abnormality in, in the processing of A-beta, which is, which is probably a primary process of neurons, is leading to the development of an aggregate which is being responded to in an inappropriate way by the macrophage. So that's a, that's a non-cell autonomous microglia response. We'd like to understand what's going on there. And then finally, consideration of, of regulatory networks as complex phenotypes for therapeutic modulation. If we, if we think we have a treatment for a, uh, a condition that is really acting on these regulatory networks, we, we need to actually have the tools to be able to tell us that our treatment uh, is working. And so with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Uh, I would just like to uh, acknowledge, uh, as I have already, Casey Romanowski, Sven Heinz, and Chris Benner. The in vivo work uh, that I showed you was, was uh, led by David Gosselin, uh, working with Verena Link, a computational biologist, and uh, we had uh, help from uh, Frederick Geisman and Hannah Gardner at King's College. Um, thank you very much.
why you make the big bucks. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, with uh, promoter regions, you find transcription factors typically 500 to 3,000 base pairs upstream, um, the, the binding sites. With enhancers, how far do you typically look around an enhancer to find binding sites? Right. So, you know, the, the enhancers could be, you know, hundreds of kilobases away. Uh, we, you know, for the purposes of, of what I've told you about today, we're, we're defining enhancers as, as basically being anything that's more than, actually more than 500 base, base pairs away. And when we look at, at promoters and we look at the nucleosome free region and the characteristics uh, surrounding the transcriptional start site, you know, our, our thinking is that the promoter is a relatively discrete unit. It's about 500 base pairs or so. So anything after that is, is an enhancer. Uh, I haven't told you anything at all about connections between enhancers and promoters, and, and that is a you know, huge area in and of itself and one that we're very interested in. Uh, I would say the rules in, in, in the macrophage are very much like they are in, in other cell types. So you have regions that are close, enhancers that are close by, and, then, and, and most of the, the, the information seems to be within a couple of you know, 10, 20, 30 uh, kilobases, but you know, we were open to regulatory elements existing much further away. So I, I'm not sure that I made my question clear. They're not the distance of an enhancer to a promoter, but if you're looking for the transcription factor binding sites that are sort of regulating the enhancer itself, yep. how far around the enhancer do you typically find? Oh, those, you mean what's, those... what's the distribution of uh, the spacing of the transcription factors within that element? Relating to that enhancer. Related yeah. to that enhancer, typically. okay. Um, so, you know, so, so enhancers look remarkably like promoters. <laughs> Uh, with respect to those sorts of, of dimensions. And uh, so if we do a, uh, an analysis, a spatial distribution analysis of, of how far apart things are from, from P1, for example, if we centered on P1, you know, it's, it's 150, 200 base pairs are sort of the, the uh, plus and minus 100, 150 to 200 base pairs is sort of the, the average. Hi, my question is about what you know about the protein-protein interactions amongst right. these different players assembling, and, and specifically, has anyone looked at whether mutations in the sites involved right. in the protein-protein interactions would affect the uh, yeah. function of these enhancers? Great question. So, um, so w this actually relates to the question I just answered, which is how far apart are the motifs for the you know for P1 and CBP, for example, and they're variable. So for most of the um, enhancers that we look at, there isn't a fixed distance between motif one and motif two that would make you think that there's a ternary complex where proteins interact and then bind. Uh, and so we, we, we don't think that a ternary complex recognizing motifs is, is the explanation for most of what we observe. We can't exclude the possibility that proteins interact with each other in some way and that helps concentrate them in the vicinity of an enhancer. But right now, we don't see strong evidence that, there, that a particular protein-protein interaction is necessary for this initial selection of the enhancer. 